everyone, Erin Tobin, who is the VP at the uh, New York uh, Preservation League in Albany. And she's here to discuss with us the funding and the grants having to do with extending the uh, historic district. And as you all know, we have uh, a small historic district at the Four Corners. And we are thinking about extending it I don't know about both directions, but at least on Route 5. And did you see Route 5 as you were coming in? Okay, it's beautiful. All right, so I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Michael Yuma, who is the Genesee County Historian. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And Garth Swanson, who is the Stafford Historian and a professor at the, the local college. And Linda Call, who is the president of the Historical Society. We have them all. Nice. <laughs> and Phyllis. Darling, who is the secretary <laughs> of the Historical Society, and Andy was on the board, Andy Darling was on the board. And this is Alicia Kaus, and she often records for us, so we have a whole a history of what we're doing in this uh, group. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for coming out on a slightly rainy Tuesday. Um, <laughs> Oh, that's okay. I just need to start. Oh, and this is Reverend yeah. Colleen O'Connor. And this is Erin. Oh, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. So, as I said, uh, I'm Erin Tobin with the Preservation League of New York State. Um, although I don't have the printed handouts, I do have a couple newsletters here and our annual report. So if you want to read those, pick one up um, after I'm done speaking, feel free. Um, we are the statewide historic preservation nonprofit based in Albany, uh, but we cover all 62 counties of New York. And um, because this is such a nice small group, this presentation will be pretty informal. So please feel free as I go through to stop, ask me questions, um, and we can kind of work uh, along the way uh, as we go. The, the Preservation League has multiple programs. So we're based in Albany. We work all over the state. We um, work with local preservation colleagues. So I know Cynthia Howe came and spoke with you all. Um, she's with the Landmark Society of Western New York. They're one of our local preservation colleagues. We're the statewide, they're the local who we work with and support. We provide technical services and outreach programs like this that I'm doing right now. Um, we have a Seven to Save program where every other year we highlight seven endangered properties or property types around the state. Uh, so in this area, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Wells Barns, um, but Wells Barns are on our seven to save list. Um, if you move a little further east, the Manchester Roundhouse is also on our seven to save list. Um, uh, and uh, we like to call attention to those resources. Um, we'll actually be soliciting for our next 2020-2021 seven to save this fall, um, and uh, we consider properties that have a statewide significance or highlight a statewide issue. So the Wells Barns, it's not just about the Wells Barns, but it's about how people can preserve their barns in general around the state. Same with the Manchester Roundhouse. That is one example, an extraordinary example, of a very important um, railroad uh, transfer point, uh, but it also is indicative of the um, how to preserve our industrial rail history. We make grants and loans, and that's mostly what I'm going to be talking to you about today, our grant programs, preserve New York and technical assistance grants. We do have a revolving loan program, and that can offer loans for um, capital repairs, acquisition. Um, it tends to bridge to state funding, so there are short-term loans, just a couple of years, up to $200,000. But if you get a state grant, those are usually reimbursement grants. So whoever receives the funding needs to come up with that money to pay the contractor before they can get paid back. So that's what our, our loan program really tends to do. We have, do public policy initiatives. We advocate for effective preservation policies at the local, state, and federal level. Um, we work with local historic preservation commissions. We work um, at the state capitol with the legislature and 
governor's office uh, on things like the historic tax credit program, and then we also go down once a year to Washington, D.C. to support um, the, the federal money that helps the state preservation office, and then Julian Adams came. So we work with Julian and his colleagues um, in D.C. and all over the state, but we've gone out to D.C. to express support for the funding that allows him to come and do his job. Um, and then we award historic preservation projects. We just had our Excellence in Preservation Awards program uh, down in New York City. Uh, we award projects all over the state. Uh, we uh, recently awarded the Sibley's Building Restoration in downtown Rochester as a local, semi-local example of a project that we've awarded. So um, uh, there's me on the right in the red uh, in a basement in the um, town of Fine, way up in the North Country, and my colleague uh, Frances, who's our technical and grant program manager. She's on a boat cataloging buildings in the Thousand Islands. We work all over the state, and Frances might be one of your first points of contact if you decide to consider a grant. She is the person. Um, who most people reach out to uh, to talk about grants or technical services. So you Can have to say the name. Be sure, it's Francis Gubler, G U B L E R. Thank you. And um, and she is with the person. So she's our program manager. So you have a National Register Historic District, so you know a little bit about what that means. I have this slight slide in here because a lot of people um, are concerned about what National Register listing means and um, what it does and doesn't do for you. It does not restrict local property rights. Private property owners, this church, which I'm assuming is in the Historic District, but you should, you know, you can do whatever you want to this building with your private funds that you raise. You can paint it whatever color you want. You can put whatever addition you want on it. You could tear it down. Um, not, not that you would, <laughs> but National Register designation, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a double edged sword because private property rights are paramount in this country. So as long as you're using private funding, not government funding, but private funding, you can do what you want with National Register buildings. That also means it doesn't protect them the way that people might want them to be protected or think that they are protected. Um, now where this comes in is if there is state or local funding, then there's an extra layer of review. It's only a layer of review. It's advisory, especially if there's state funding. So the best, um, the advocacy defense if you're trying to save a building is public pressure, is an advocacy campaign, is showing your groundswell of support for a building, <laughs> and also working with um, your municipality and working with the building owner um, and trying to find uh, some good alternatives. Um, uh, but one thing that's important to know here, it talks about the economic, um, you know, it's economically onerous to have buildings on the National Register uh, because you're not told what to do with your building. It's not as though you need to go through all these extra hoops. And actually, historic preservation, saving what you have in your community is the best thing for economic development. There are studies after studies after studies that show um, that heritage tourism is a huge, is a huge draw. Um, it is one of the best ways to inject um, life into a local economy. Uh, the historic preservation um, tax credits that we have are, um, are one of the best job creators. The historic tax credit in New York State, that's people using um, tax credits for uh, re rehabilitation. That created over 17,000 jobs just in New York State last year. Uh, it's also the biggest generator of local, state, and federal taxes. It helps generate local property taxes. When you have a building that's been rehabilitated, instead of a vacant lot, it contributes more to your local economy. So our, um, our programs, our technical assistance grant and 
Improv, preserve New York grant programs. They're both partnership programs with the New York State Council on the Arts. So I know what you're really mostly focused on is a uh, cultural resource survey, you know, expanding the National Reg Register, the historic district here. Um, and that would fall under Preserve New York. But I'm gonna touch briefly on the technical assistance grant, which we call TAG program, um, because that uh, could be relevant and is, is worth noting. Our TAG program <coughs> has been around since 2012. We um, just awarded a grant to the Genesee Orleans Regional Arts Council. We fund um, arts or cultural structures um, so those are buildings that house an arts or cultural function. Neither of these grants, I should have a, a caveat, and it's going to be repeated in the slides, but while I'm talking about who can apply, um, we cannot fund religious organizations. So we could not fund this church. Um, that's a New York State Council on the Arts charter rule, um, and, uh, and there are other sources of funding for religious institutions. Um, uh, the applicant must own the building or have a long-term lease. It has to have that arts or cultural function. And we can offer a $4,000, uh, up to a $4,000 grant for a $5,000 project. So that's for the Tate Club, <clears throat> former Tate Club in the Tate Yeah. <laughs> so we can fund a variety of different kinds of studies, like a building condition survey, uh, engineering or structural analysis. So See the building that's kitty corner here, the lodge, became owned by a municipality or nonprofit, and that new owner wanted to study it to see could this become some sort of an arts incubator space. Um, we could, they could come to us for funding to hire an engineer to make sure uh, that it's structurally sound and to provide some guidance on what needs to happen to make it structurally sound. Um, so we fund a lot of those. Or a feasibility study, what do you need to do? We give a lot of money to where we don't fund religious institutions. Many of our grants go to municipalities, especially municipalities, small towns, villages, um, uh, sometimes to nonprofits that acquire abandoned churches. Um, you know, a lot of abandoned churches around the state, around the region, around the country, um, historic buildings, and um, they're often like right here, the lifeblood of a community and a, an important community meeting space. And when the congregation leaves, the community wants to figure out what to do with that space. And so we can come in, because then if it's owned by a, a secular nonprofit or a municipality, we can help support the study and figure out what to do with that building. Um, often it becomes a community center, a performing arts space, a multi-use purpose space. Um, we can fund energy efficiency studies. We can fund um, a specialized conservation study. One of my favorite um, specialized conservation studies to mention is uh, it's a stenciling that's in the Mohawk Valley. The, the, the Nellis Tavern um, you know, on the Mohawk River has, um, you know, it's an 18th century tavern. It has literally is the textbook stencils uh, that are still in the tavern. So we funded a paint conservator to come and study how they can preserve those stencils. So that's a great example of another kind of project we can fund. Uh, so if you want to consider a, a TAG uh, application, that's your quick checklist, nonprofit municipality, arts or cultural building, $5,000 or less project budget, uh, planning study project. Okay, you said that that, that it, organization has to own the building. Own or have a long-term lease, okay. yes. And that's NISCA's rules. Uh, Long-term lease, it, uh, at least, I think it's 15 years. So, Preserve New York. Uh, so, oh, one more thing for the TAG program. Our next, that's our next uh, upcoming application deadline, and that's a fall, it's an annual fall program. So the applications for the TAG uh, program will be due uh, in September, I think I threw a deadline out at the end of my presentation. Um, and it's, uh, Frances, Frances has a better memory than me, so she knows the date off the top of her head. Uh, but it'll be due in, uh, in September, maybe October. Uh, and, um, <laughs> and that's our next upcoming grant deadline. <coughs> New York is our spring grant program. 
Um, I'm actually leaving you to go do a grant review for a Preserve New York application. Um, we've run Preserve New York since 1993, so we have a much longer history with the program. Same deal, nonprofits, municipalities can apply. Um, it has to be a secular nonprofit um, and can't be owned by New York State. Applicants must own the building and have a long term lease. Um, for Preserve New York, uh, we have four very specific types of projects that we fund, um, but we do have flexibility in, in the grant award we can make. Um, you know, it typically runs between $3,000 and $10,000, but we don't have a maximum. Um, we have generally uh, about $200,000, give or take, $240,000 to award for Preserve New York um, each year. Uh, and um, we tend to have more than twice that number of applications. So we're not making big grants because um, we're very oversubscribed, which is great. We require a 20% cash match. So if you have a consultant um, proposal for $10,000 to um, expand the historic district here, um, whoever the applicant is has to show that um, they're putting in $2,000 of cash, not in kind, not donated, but cash towards the consulting cost. And these are the four eligible project types. Three of them are site specific, like the TAG um, uh, program, that the site specific project types are where the applicant has to build the building or have the lease. Um, those are a historic structure report, a building condition report. So, a historic structure report, I'll get into what each one of these are. Um, or a cultural landscape report. So those are all reports on a particular place, site, building. Um, and then cultural resource surveys. And that is where, uh, obviously, we don't have to own the building because it's a survey of many buildings. And um, there are several different layers to cultural resource surveys. So the building condition report, that's the comprehensive condition analysis of the structure. So if it were a building condition report of this building, you'll be looking at it, you know, from roof all the way down to the basement, inside and outside. Um, what's the building's condition? You walk away with a document that gave you a prioritized list of repairs that you needed to make. I believe you have costs associated with that. Um, you'll have photographs, maybe you might have schematic drawings. Um, you have a, basically a template that you can use to then move forward with a restoration or rehabilitation project. Um, it is an excellent tool for anybody looking to do um, a major, you know, who knows their building needs restoration or rehabilitation. Um, it's a very good for fundraising because, you know, the building condition report might be seven or ten thousand dollars, but if you're looking at a two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar project um, that you often end up with on a, on a bigger building, not necessarily a building this size. Uh, Spending that initial investment in your building condition report will make it so much easier for you to get grants, for you to get private donations. People want to give money to projects that they know are well planned and well thought through and guided by a professional. Um, one thing that often happens is a, a nonprofit historical society has a historic building, they're trying to maintain it, they have a leak, they call a roofer, the roofer quotes them some astronomical amount to do some kind of project. Um, and they don't necessarily know if that's actually what they need. Maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's the flashing. Maybe it's something else. So you really, having that outside architect expert come in and say what's needed can ultimately even save an organization money. Um, Here's one of those great examples of a cultural center and a historic church um, down in the Hudson Valley that got a building condition report for its um, headquarters building. Um, so the historic structure report takes the building condition report and builds on it. A building condition report is a chapter of a historic structure report. An HSR goes suit to nuts. It's not just the building's condition, it's the, it's the construction chronology. So again, if it were this building, when did that little kitchen addition come on? When did plumbing come in? What was it initially used for? Who built it and why? Um, if it's a house, especially, you'll get information about who its occupants were. Um, and you might end up with a paint analysis as well. What are the historic paint colors? 
in addition to that um, building condition uh, bit with the prioritized list of repairs. The stroke structure reports are really meant for buildings that are interpreted. So this building doesn't need a historic structure report necessarily because it's an expensive document. They can run 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars and up. Um, but they can also be cheaper. Uh, you know, so they're really, you know, about uh, buildings that have the public come in and want to learn more about its history. Or if you're trying to figure out things like the construction technology, it can be useful. So every so often there's a building that could really use one, even if it's not interpreted, because um, it's got such a, an interesting and complex construction history, and the owner's trying to figure out um, how best to use it. Yeah. So here's an example, actually, of just that, where um, it's an art center in Poughkeepsie um, that is going forward with a historic structure report. It got funding from us for a technical assistance grant, and um, and then uh, moved forward with a historic structure report um, that was advised because it's got this interesting construction chronology, and even though it's an art center. Uh, the, um, the Dutchess County Art Association wanted to know um, more information about the building's history. So the cultural landscape report is like a historic structure report, but it's about the landscape, either a design landscape or a natural landscape. A lot of like <coughs> cemeteries um, might be a good example of a type of site that would benefit from a cultural landscape report, or if you have a big estate. Um, and you want to recreate the pathways. Uh, it's not a planting plan, but it's about understanding what the right gar where the gardens were, where the path should go, if you're trying to figure out where a parking lot should go um, on a multi-acre estate. Uh, a cultural landscape report can tell you, you know, don't put the parking lot on the site where the kitchen garden was, that kind of thing. Here's a great example. This is the uh, woodland uh, down in Orange County, uh, where the village applied for the historic structure report to help guide it. Um, and then finally, cultural resource survey. So this is this can be an inventory. Um, there's several different layers. So a reconnaissance level survey looks at a larger area, typically uh, that has not been studied says, where could there be historic districts? A uh, great example, the city of Rochester is just about to complete a city-wide survey. They went quadrant by quadrant. So they looked, um, right now they're looking at the southwest section. So they're taking the entire southwest quadrant of the city and um, doing a, a baseline survey to say, where could there be historic districts? What's the history um, you know, what's the history of the development of this section of the city? Uh, where could there be individual landmarks? Um, and, and really about trying to tell the complete history of a place to then figure out what is historically, architecturally, and culturally significant. Um, I don't know that you would need that kind of study for here because it's a, it's a pretty clear, you know, if you didn't have clear boundaries, then our reconnaissance level survey might be helpful because it could say, here's where we think the boundaries would be. Um, you have pretty clear boundaries here, so I don't think that would be necessary. But like I said, in a place like Rochester, in a place where there could be multiple historic districts or you don't know where it's going to start or stop, it's good to have that baseline. An intensive level survey takes that up a notch. Um, there's Professionals have uh, different lines for where this begins and where, the, or where this begins and this ends, and so they can kind of lead into each other. Uh, I usually think of an intensive level survey as, um, uh, to me, it's often looking at a particular building type. So, for example, uh, about ten years ago, we funded a survey of farm farmsteads out in eastern New York in the town of Pittstown which has this amazing collection of farms that have at least five outbuildings. I mean, they've got the corn crib, the barn, the ice house, five outbuildings in addition to the farmhouse. So we funded a study for an architectural historian to look at all of the farmsteads and document them 
so that then they could put together a, a statement of significance for those farmsteads, that then the individual farmers could nominate their, build their farms to the National Register. So it wasn't a National Register nomination, but it was a more intensive level survey. Um, state and National Register nomination, the New York State Register and the National Register are pretty synonymous. It goes through a process. You start with the State Register, the State Board of Historic Preservation does the review, gives a nod, and it goes down to the National Park Service. Um, that is where you nominate for the National Register. So usually these things inform this, but occasionally communities go straight to a National Register nomination. Um, again, we've, um, we've funded through Preserve New York a lot of village-wide National Register nominations. Um, and well, the word was not because it's a downtown one. Um, I'm trying to think of a good village wide. Lions is one that comes to mind further east. But so in Lions, we funded a, a National Register nomination, not quite village wide, but almost. It didn't need to have a survey because its boundaries were pretty clear already. Um, and then along, again, in Montgomery County in the Mohawk Valley, um, almost all of the little villages along the Mohawk River there are full village-wide National Register Historic Districts. And that just happened in the last 10 years, really in part because of our state historic tax credit, because property owners in, um, you know, Canada Harry wanted to be able to use the historic tax credit to fix up their houses and get 20% back. So that's been a big drive up of National Register nominations and historic districts. Uh, and then there's local district designation. I really don't recommend that outside. I mean, some communities, yes. Yeah, the city of Ithaca has a local uh, historic district. Obviously, Rochester does, Buffalo. Um, but you want to do, you want to do this first, because this is where the funding sources are. This is where there's tax credits. Uh, local districts, they have to all. Preservation regulation happens at the local level, which is as it should be. You want your rules, you want your permits to be decided locally because you're, you know, Albany or DC shouldn't be coming in and telling a community what it should or shouldn't do. You can decide whether you want to have that additional layer of regulation. Local historic districts, that's a whole other presentation, um, uh, but that's where, uh, a, you know, a preservation board could say, no, you can't demolish this. Um, and that can be very important and very helpful, uh, but it, can, it has to be done with community buy-in and support, or it can be very divisive. And it can sour a community on any kind of historic preservation, including the friendly, incentive-laden National Register. And we've seen this happen. We've seen communities try to jump to a local district, to regulation, too fast, um, and, uh, and it backfires. And then I... um, so here, here's the Lori uh, Business Council study. And this is just proof that National Register nominations are good economic development. The Leroy Business Council is the one that initiated this, the National Register nomination for downtown Leroy. Uh, so again, I, I kind of went through this. State National Register is right places. It's not local landmarking. It's coordinated with the State Preservation Office that's Julian Adams and the National Park Service using the individual or the district listings. Um, and the significance is at the local, state, or national level. And I like this picture because you know, it can be a bridge. A commercial building, a residence, um, a, a, an early structure. It's, it's not just about the pretty house. Uh, and these are the things that it, it offers the short tax credits, grant availability, as well as the civic pride and sense of place. And that's really not to be underestimated. Um, that survey that we did in Pittstown for those farmsteads, um, and this is, you know. Rural Rensselaer County uh, um, farmers, and they there was no incentive at that time, but they were so proud of the history in their community and of their farms.
that they wanted to designate their farmsteads on the National Register. Um, a few years later, those farms became eligible for historic tax credits, and then they could take advantage of them. But even before they had historic tax credit eligibility, they were excited to, um, you know, and proud of the history of their farms and excited to promote that history and share that and document it. So um, I've talked a lot about historic tax credits. Again, Julian and I often do a road show that's all about historic tax credits. So I'm giving you the very, very brief of notes version. But um, what the historic tax credits are, here's that there in your little historic district. And um, uh, there's a federal historic tax credit program and a state historic tax credit program. And um, the federal historic tax credit program is for income producing properties. So I'll use the large building again. Let's say that was bought by somebody who wanted to turn it into a restaurant and, and, um, and make it a, a, for a business. Um, and they would, they could use the historic tax credits for whatever rehabilitation work they were doing on their building. They would get 20% of their rehabilitation costs back. So say they spend a million dollars, they get $200,000 back in tax credits at the federal level, federal income tax credits that can be carried forward. They would also qualify for state historic tax credits. Um, our state historic tax credit program is census tract qualified. So the building has to be on the National Register, just like it does for the federal program, which it does, which that building would make because you're in a historic district. Um, but you also have to be in a census tract where the median income is at or below 100% of the state median family income. And that's because um, the Preservation League was one of the lead outside advocates for our state historic tax credit. And um, it was very important to legislators and to the governor at the time that it not be about gentrification, that state funding not go towards you know, wealthy homeowners in Greenwich Village or Park Ave down in New York City, that it, this is about um, restoring communities that need that economic development incentive. Um, this really is an economic development incentive. Um, so then you get 20% back. So that million dollar project, you get 200,000 in federal historic tax credits and 200,000 in state historic tax credits. Um, there is also that state historic homeowner tax credit, which is a huge driver of historic district designation right now. And I love the historic homeowner tax credit program. Again, I could talk about it for more than half an hour. But in sum, uh, and I'm guessing there's no houses in the tiny Stafford district. There but are two. There's two? Okay. So say one of the, are they unoccupied? So one of those homeowners right now, um, if they're contributing, are they, are they old? <laughs> yeah. I'm one of them. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> no, it's not a new construction. Is it a new oh, oh, yes. No, they're the old. Don't have that. 
but I'm just saying, you know, you have to have justifiable boundaries, but you do want to make those boundaries as big as possible. Um, and the, the homeowner tax credit is not retroactive, unfortunately. <laughs> but, so you could, so say all you have to do, all you have to do, in, in an old house, and I say old on purpose because people think historic, like it has to be pristine and like, oh, you know, it's not. If that's, as long as it's, you know, more than 50 years old and part of the historic district, I'm sure it's contributing, um, you have to spend at least $5,000. 5% of that on the exterior, which is pretty easy to do. Um, and you have to get approved by the State Preservation Office before you start your project. So if you're thinking of doing anything, first off, take lots of pictures of your house as it is right now. Um, and, and then second is call the State Preservation Office. Um, and uh, Julian, over, Julian oversees the people who oversee the person who would be given that approval. So there's a lot of layers at the State Preservation Office, but um, um, I'm trying to think of who it would, would be working with. They can just change a lot of boundaries. Um, and actually, the person who's thinking of would probably retire. But, anyways, it could be do you need a new boiler? Do you want storm windows? Do you need to replace your storm windows? Do you have to fix your porch? Do you have to paint your house? Do you need a new roof? Um, here's what you can't spend the money on. New vinyl windows, you're not gonna get the historic tax credit for that. Um, a new addition, you're not gonna get the historic tax credit. Vinyl siding, you're not gonna get the historic tax credit. You can still do all those things, you're just not gonna get state money that's based on historic preservation to do that. Um, and on the window issue, we, um, we highly recommend if you have your existing wood windows to first put storms, new storms and screens on and they make a world of difference and are a lot cheaper than vinyl windows and will last you a lot longer. Let's say you already have vinyl windows, they're not going to make you put old wood windows back in, um, but they, if you want to get the historic tax credit, they would probably work with you on an acceptable new window because the vinyl windows have about a 15, 10 to 15 year lifespan. So if you do need to replace those, they will work with you. It's not like they're going to make you recreate what isn't there anymore. Um, if you have vinyl siding on, they can help you take out. Uh, so that is the historic homeowner tax credit. You do not need to hire an architect if you're going to use the historic homeowner tax credit. Um, you can fill out those applications. You can call our office and you with that, um, and uh, the State Preservation Office can also have Could that plan be used to relocate a building on a piece of property? No. Once a building is moved, it no longer qualifies for the National Register. So all these incentives will disappear if a building is moved. Even if it's moved within that within the historic district? By and large, yes. Um, the Farmington Quaker Meeting House in Farmington, uh, outside Rochester, uh, is an exception to that rule where it was moved um, and remained in the historic district. It was moved kitty corner to where it was, and it still qualifies for, for the National Register and for grants. It is an exception to the rule. Um, we highly discourage buildings because if a property owner wants to demolish a building, thinks that relocating a building is a viable preservation solution, then you've just lost your battle because it will never stay on its site. Um, and if a building is moved, it loses its context. And I'm going to use that lodge as another example. Or the church. You know, there's a reason why these buildings were built at this important four corners. And if these buildings are moved, if the church is picked up and moved, even down the road, you've lost the important context of four corners. Four corners are a really important bit of telling you you've now arrived in a place, and here's a bit, here's, here's what it might have been. Same as if you just demolished the buildings and put in a right aid, suddenly you've just kind of lost your, your sense of place. Um, 
um, same with the schoolhouse, you know, as schoolhouses and churches and lodges and inns and those were always at the four corners and that and they were there for a really important reason. Yeah, you know, if it's moved like 20 feet down the road, you can probably work with the state preservation office. I know that they have worked with people on that before. But um, by and large, it, it's so expensive to move a building that in most instances, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Downstate, it happens a lot. In Long Island and Westchester County, there's a lot more money to just pick up and move a building wherever they want. And then you just have no idea what that place used to be. Um, and you get, but the building becomes an object. And so it can be an interesting museum object, right? If you go to the Genesee Country Museum, those are a bunch of, co that's a collection of objects that happen to be buildings that are created in a, in a museum exhibit. I have a, <coughs> a question about uh, the timing. Is it like, a, can you get this done this season? I want to put in new wind the windows, I want to help with the windows. Is this a two year project? Is this? Oh, in for the tax credits? But, yeah. Can are I get you, it done this season? Are you in the historic district? I, this is an imaginary question. Oh. <laughs> if you're in the house, want to do something in my house, say August, is it too late to do that now? I don't think so. Okay. No. Um, I don't think so. They should have a 30 day turnaround. Oh. And that's where if you start the, the minute you call them, they'll start working with you. They, they want to allow people to take advantage of the tax credit. So you call them, and they, that's why I say take pictures, because if you don't get a response and you do the thing, and like let's say you, let's use the windows. Let's say you have white vinyl windows and you're gonna put in aluminum clad wood windows where you could have gotten the tax credit. But they don't know because you didn't take pictures of, oh, I had white vinyl before. And they don't know that. And they say, well, you might not qualify because how do we know you didn't take out your historic windows? Or if you're redoing your inside and it had been gutted, there was nothing left. But they don't know that. So always take pictures of what you have before you start the project. And then they'll be more lenient with you on, not quite retroactive, but on that whole timeline. Um, where it gets dicey is if it were November. Don't apply for the tax credit in November because it's the end of the tax year and they're, they get really backed up on turning things around. So now is fine. You, can, you should be able to get it done within this construction season. It should not take two years. So what did you just say about retro? Can you do any, can you get any tax, tax credit this year? Something I did in the spring, I didn't know about this project. I'm just probably not, unless you unless you highly document. The only let me put it this way: the um, the the rope answer is no, no retroactive. What they might say, not quite, but say is if, if you took a lot of pictures and if we can see through the pictures what you did and that we would have approved it and that it's been the last three months, then you might have an opportunity to take advantage of it. So if it's something that you did three years ago, no way. Yeah, like when I paid my house a couple years ago. No, no. But if it was in April or February, you might have a chance if you took if you documented it very well and if the reviewer at the state can understand what the project was from start to finish based on your records and your photographs they will usually be more lenient absolutely yeah so that's tax credits um our grant program uh it's kind of similar because we don't award retroactively. So if you want to come to us for a grant for the things I talked about, the surveys or the building reports or the landscape reports, um, we don't have our applications online because we want everybody to call us to get an application because we don't want anybody to fill out an application if they don't qualify because that just wastes your time. 
So you call, you'll probably talk to Fran, we'll talk to you about your project, and if it qualifies, we'll send you an application. Are they um, 20 pages, or is it no, just, no, please? No, they are, we actually, <sighs> applications tend to score lower if they hired a grant consultant with us. We, they're meant to be filled out by volunteers, by hand if necessary. We, there are Word documents so you can type it into the computer, but we have had handwritten applications that have gotten grants from us. We, you know, it's, it's historical societies that apply to us. Um, so that's who, that's, that's, what we, <laughs> that's what we get. So um, they are, the tag application I think is two pages, the Preserve New York application maybe is three or four, you know, um, the short answer questions. We ask for a one page narrative <coughs> description of the project. And we outline the things that the grant panel will be looking for as you describe your project. So it is very clear. Um, you'll want to find the consultant, the architect or engineer, whoever is going to do your project as part of this application process because we want to know who's going to be working on it when we review the application. Do you have recommendations of consultants? We do. We have a list of consultants who have successfully completed our grant funded projects. So we can't recommend them, but we can say, here's the people around the state who have done this well. Um, and, and I should add, we're always eager to add to that list. So if you know somebody who's qualified who's not on that list, great. You won't get docked for that video. Um, but qualifications is key. Um, get what you pay for. So you don't want pro bono. You don't want, you know, your pro bono assistance should be somebody on the building committee um, to help review the work of the consultant, not the actual person doing the work themselves. Um, and you want to make sure on a historic building that they have experience working on historic buildings. So we have this problem a lot with municipalities where they have an engineer on retainer, and that might be a great engineer for the roads and the sewers and the um, environmental permits and everything else, but that's not the engineer to say, um, you know, is this trust system in this 1850s building, you know, um, structurally sound to carry the load for the, you know, for the use of the building. That's a very different skill set. Um, so we do look at your uh, consultant qualifications as part of it. Um, and uh, because we get funded through the New York State Council on the Arts, we have to be strict about application deadlines. So you have to get us everything on time, read through the checklist, send us everything we asked for, um, follow the directions, send us good photographs, uh, let's see. Oh, so I mean, I've been talking, how I've been going through this. So there's the three criteria, which is historic preservation, project excellence, um, the fiscal and managerial competence and service to the public. And this is um, pretty good guidance in general for any grant application. Um, but, uh, so this is the right project for the, for the building um, or for the municipality. If, it's a, if you want to make your historic district bigger, um, you know, is this something that the State Preservation Office says is a good idea? Um, is it the right consultant that's historic preservation project quality? Are you fiscal and managerial competence? Um, we, we've had several of these types of organizations apply where it's a nonprofit and they own the, the land. Um, the board is made up of four family members. Two of them are paid staff members to the nonprofit and they pay themselves each $100,000 a year. Um, this is an actual example. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not going to score well for the fiscal yeah, managerial competence if that's who is applying. Um, uh, so, uh, also, if you can't complete the application, if you're missing things that are on our checklist, you won't score high on fiscal managerial competence because you can't complete the application. Um, service to the public, uh, that's where um, 
So again, if with your survey example, is it something that the community is supportive of? Um, or is this uh, a very divisive thing to a community? If it's a nonprofit, um, say it's a historical society, what, you know, what programs does, does the historical society have? How does it outreach to the community? How does it try to bring in new members? Um, uh, how do other community groups use it? Um, so, so say we had um, one of our applicants and successful applicants was uh, a Masonic Center, uh, where it's a nonprofit Masonic Center foundation that opens up its lodge to community events and um, and cultural events and things on its non, you know, on its first floor outside of where the meeting rooms are. Um, so, you know, how do they? How is the building made open to the public? Uh, which is the sort of thing that um, grant making. So this is a perfect example of how the church has made this building open to the public for public events. If we could fund the church, the fact that it opens up to buildings like this, events like this, would be a big point in its favor. And organizations that do fund churches look on stuff like this very highly. And so, um, so again, we say this like five times because following directions is really important. I don't think this group would have a problem with that, but it's just, um, you'd be surprised. We have a checklist. Um, Fran will talk before the application deadline. We'll work with you, and you know, people call her dozens of times. She's wonderful. Um, I can also work with her. She's very really nice to be that person. Budgets, we have to have an organizational budget. We need income and expenses. Um, we will work with organizations that don't know what an organizational budget is and give tutorials on how to figure out income versus expenses and um, what that means. But it shouldn't just say income, $500, expenses, $500. It should be bake sale, $200, membership to uh, garage sale, you know, not, another $200, uh, and um, add up that way. Uh, your um, the project budget, so when you get a consultant estimate, you want to know how much that's going to cost. So you hire somebody to expand your National Register Historic District, and their budget should have an outline of what they're going to do and how much each of those things is going to cost you. Um, and, uh, and so if you have other projects beyond that, it should only be the National Register District. Um, I'll use the site specific the Historical Society example. You know, if you're doing a $10,000 building condition of work that you know you have $100,000 of something else, don't, don't talk to us about the $100,000 or something else. Just talk to us about the $10,000 building condition report. Pictures. Yeah, I love this one. Um, <laughs> the grant review panel has probably never seen your, your site. They've never seen, maybe they have, but let's, you, let's say you, they haven't been to Stafford. They don't know the place, they don't know the streetscape. So you're telling a story of your place through your pictures. And these are two types of pictures that we've gotten from grant applicants. Um, this tells the story of a beautiful barn. It's now a dance center. This is an updated electrical outlet surrounded by carpet. Um, now, you do, you can understand that the building systems might need to be replaced, but this was the only picture we got. So the grant review panel had no idea what this building looked like. They did not get funded. They, they came back and they got funded in a later round. It's actually a very sweet ad on that library. Um, but pictures really matter. They matter so much. Good streetscapes. Overall picture of your building. Again, you're telling the story through the photographs. And there you go. Um, there's our contact information. We are always available for phone calls, for emails. Uh, this time of year, I don't think Fran and I have seen each other in like three weeks because we've both been traveling. She was out in 
Buffalo last week, I'm out here this week. Um, but we are always available to answer questions. And I'll have more other more contact information. Um, so the last thing, um, check your checklist that uh, if it's an incomplete application, it's just not going to get funded. And we, we used to be threatened with the league for 12 years, and we used to have a lot more flexibility with Preserve New York, um, where if, you're, if things change as we're reviewing your application, we could take new documents, we could update a budget. If you're missing a page from your application, we could get that completed page in send all that new stuff to the panel. We can't do that anymore. The state has cracked down, and again, because we get state funding, what we have by midnight on the application deadline day is what the grant panel sees. And if you didn't submit your consultant proposal or your organizational budget, by that time, you might send it two weeks later, but they can't see that. So they're going to know that it wasn't submitted on time. And that's where you're going to get points off for this managerial the There are, ins there are s small instances where we can help you if it's like 8 o'clock the next morning, you realize, oh my goodness, like I meant to attach this thing and it didn't go through. Well, that's OK. That's different. Um, so always check your checklist. These are a bunch of other funding sources in New York State. Um, are you all familiar with the Sacred Sites grant program? Have you received funding from Sacred Sites? Um, I don't know about this here. I served the church in Uruguay, and we're in the process of doing that. Oh, okay, great. Mm -hmm. So are you working with Colleen or Anne? Anne. Anne, okay. Yeah. I used to work with that program. I was oh, okay. 15 years ago. So it's a great program for um, historic religious properties. Mm -hmm and it can fund historic houses of worship that are on the National Register or in a historic district. So all those things I said that we can fund religious institutions for, the Sacred Sites program can, if it's on the National Register. Um, and so Anne Friedman is the program director, she's wonderful. Colleen P. Meyer is the program manager. She is also wonderful. Um, they're a great resource. The Environmental Protection Fund through parks is another great source of capital funding. It's really the only historic preservation capital funding that's a state grant. There's other state grants that can be used for restoration, but aren't specifically dedicated to preservation. The EPF has a specific historic preservation funding stream. Um, it's very small, it's pretty political. You have to convince your Regional Economic Development Council but, um, but they do fund preservation projects. Local foundations, of course, I mentioned the tax credit programs, and then NISCO themselves, they have funding available through their capital projects. And once again, there's my contact information. There's all the ways you can find the preservation league. We post our guidelines online, um, as well as our FAQ. So I will email, before I even leave, I'll email the link um, to all of that online for the last funding round. So we don't have our guidelines for the fall tag round up yet. We need to get through this Preserve New York round to know how much we have to give in the fall. Uh, bless you. Uh, but, uh, but it will be up by August for sure. In, ter in terms of um, expanding the historic district, that sounds like that's more of the spring? Yes. Grant? Okay. Yes. So, so if the yeah. historical society needed a project for its building, they could come in the fall. Okay. okay. The historic district would be the spring. Okay. Thank you. So um, to go to Colleen's question, what would be our first two or three steps? In, um, to get ready for the spring and to extend, uh, the steps to extend and get the grant to extend. Talk to Virginia Bartos at the State Preservation Office. She is the one who does the National Register Review for this region. 
and then call um, consultants who do National Register nominations. And the ideal would be to have, I, Virginia might not be able to travel, um, but you would want your consultant to come and take a look at Stafford and, and talk about where those boundaries might be for their proposal. Um, yeah, uh, Katie Como at Bear Associates does, or Bear Architecture does a lot of these. Mm -hmm. Who does it? Katie Como. Katie Como. Yeah, at Bear Architecture in Rochester. I'm pretty sure she's doing. I think Alan has a National Register Historic District designation, uh, a Historic District um, nomination, and I think Katie's doing it. The Landmark Society of Western New York will also do it. So somebody who was on the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have a person on our planning board that works at Barrow, but she doesn't work in any of those, and I think it'd be best to, for us to contact your contact at Barrow. Yes, probably. Um, that would, yeah, Katie's the architecture historian there, so she would be the person to contact. And then Caitlin Nyla is in the Lunar Society. Caitlin um, okay. is the planner, preservation planner at the Society. Um, they're doing a historic district in Naples right now. And they might be doing it. I can't remember if they're doing the online project or if Katie is. To approach Caitlin, who I've talked to many times, well, how would I begin my um, Say if you're interested in um, a National Register nomination to expand the historic district, and then I came and talked, and that, you know, is that something that more society would be interested in getting asked in for? I know she's a girl with Yes, yes, exactly. Caitlin and Cynthia would work together, yeah. I'm sure, on the end. And, and, and certainly with Julian, Julian and, yes, and yes. Um, Cynthia were both here. They were both encouraging us to do that. So. Yes, yes. Do we be, oh, I was just going to say it would be a good idea. Do we have to get approval from every house down the road as the district moves this way? To expand the historic district, and that's a very good question that I didn't touch on, um, you, you need owner approval for National Register. Each person? Each well, owner? if it's an individual nomination, then that owner has to approve. In a historic district, it's the majority of property owners. Um, so if you have, uh, you know, 20 property owners and two say no, you can still have a historic district. Um, if you have 20 property owners and nine say no, technically that's not the majority, but it probably wouldn't be a good idea because you're going to... What if it's technically the majority for your group? Well, for us it's... Well, this is this is what the state requires in order to create a historic district. We don't we don't need it. for a, for a grant application. You don't need to talk to property owners, I, and probably I wouldn't. So you don't need owner approval to apply to us for the grant. But let's say you get the grant, and Katie writes a historic district nomination for expanded boundaries. Then every property owner in that expanded boundary is going to get a letter from the state saying. That they're gonna that that they're in a potential new historic district, and if they object, they have to they send a letter to the state. So that's where you need over approval, and that's where people want and, to. And I would suspect if we had you coming and making they have our presentation on the tax credit, that would eliminate a lot of it. It probably would. Yeah. It probably would. But we've been surprised. We funded, there was a community in Otsego County, we funded a historic district nomination, they could have used the tax credits. There was a bunch of um, property owners who felt very strongly against any government anything, and where we had owner approval, we lost owner approval. So it is, it is something, it takes a lot of education and outreach. Um, so the fear is controlled. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's, I mean, in, in Otsego County, it was just misinformation and misunderstanding, but that's what happens. That's, that's where you, you have to do the legwork initially, probably even 
going around knocking on doors and talking to people exactly. about what what it would mean so that people rather than before they long before they get that letter from their state. Yes. So that yes. they're expecting the letter as opposed to being surprised by the letter. Yes. If people are surprised by the letter, they will almost guaranteed to have some negative reaction. <laughs> so yes, you want to do lots of light work. And and then also the state will come out and give a presentation. It's good to have Ooh, several the state will give the presentation. Probably Julian or Dan McEnany. Um, Dan yeah. is just as charming as Julian. Yeah. The historical society had had a presentation in the fall, I think, or sometime this year that sort of touched on the fact that there were tax credits available. And many of the people who were in the audience were quite dismayed to find out that their house was outside of that limit. So that's yeah. Good thing. Yeah. yeah. That's so, good. But you want it to wait until you know what those boundaries are. Mm -hmm. So that you don't, because actually, we're now starting to see the reverse, where it's not that people are mad that they're going to be in the district, People get mad that they're going to be out of the district. Yeah. So you want to make sure you know before you start advertising where those boundaries are going to be. Uh, and for us, it was certainly very frustrating that when the application was done the last time back in the 70s, that they were very narrow in, in how they envisioned. Though I wouldn't have anticipated the previous homeowner would have been interested in participating in the district. So. Right. Kind of and and life, is, life is so different yes. today than in the 1970s. That's 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and there was no tax credit then either. So. Right. right. So when these districts were created in the 70s, there was only the commercial program, that federal program. Oh. So they only looked at, and, the, and this district might have even preceded that, but they only looked at income producing commercial properties. Nobody designated houses because there was no economic incentive to do that. So we're doing a lot of catch up. Stafford is not alone in, in having these really teeny tiny historic districts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that would be only that all that was in the commercial district. The stuff that covered itself. Exactly. So when you go into a town and uh, you're going to expand or they call you to help expand the boundaries. What have people said to you that made them want to do that? That made them want to expand. They have already um, gotten the committee together. Have they already started thinking about this before they come to you? I mean, we will have done that. Mm -hmm. They're probably they're usually about where you are. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends. I mean, there's communities that weren't thinking about historic districts. And which is generally, normally there's some catalytic event that causes people to call us. So um, it's a building that's threatened, usually, or awareness of the tax credits, and then they come. And if they hadn't been thinking about expanding their historic district, usually by the time I'm done, they are thinking about expanding their historic district or creating one. Um, so that's, that's kind of the typical trajectory. Uh, and then, and then it's like once you know, it's like a, a you know just kind of a rolling effect. You know where one community does it, and then another community wants to do it. And again, that Montgomery County example, I keep using it because it's it's really remarkable. When I started at the Preservation League, there was one historic district in Montgomery County, which is a tiny county, but there was one historic district. And now I don't even know. There's probably a dozen. Because like literally every little village from Amsterdam to Little Falls is a historic district. <laughs> and that's because of the tax credit. But that started with me and Julian in 2008 giving a presentation at the DAR in Fort Plain. So, so you will come back. We will come back. I will think the challenge, at least the challenge that I see here is where to put the boundary. Because there isn't. There isn't a, a Walmart or something that would break that up. It just is. Well, is there a spot where the buildings stop? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, if, it, if it's the downtown, but the town of Stafford, I mean, right along Route 5 is one place, but if you're more expansive, it, it, the whole, the think, whole town would be. I think Route 
55 gives you a sense of where our, our boundaries might be. Yeah. Um, I think it becomes a little bit more challenging in looking at if we were to go up 237 both ways, mm -hmm. maybe the, the cemetery at one end and, and the country club at the other. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I think 237 and the Dill Transit Road, Transit Line Road, um, presents a little bit more of a challenge in how we might you know, delineate. And, and I think we might want to think about it as, as almost layers, um, and like a cabbage, and if you look at the evolution of the community and the various layers of architectural development that have taken place, and including some modern elements that have been included in, in, in there. Well, if you get off the main road, there are a lot of very, a lot of very old houses that mm -hmm. have been that have been here since the very beginning. Some, some, some classic Greek revivals. You know? yeah. So it might, I, if I were to call Virginia first, I would probably call Katie first. Katie? Yeah, because, um, and there's other consultants, uh, you know, Preservation Studios did the Laborate survey, um, but Katie's just, she's so good. Preservation Studio in Buffalo? Or? They're in Buffalo. And that's uh, Darren. Tom. Tom. Tom Knotts. Tom's coming to see. Oh, here? Mm -hmm. Okay. They're, they're good. Um, they're good. They, uh, expensive. They're expensive. And they, um, they tend to take a little bit longer. Okay. Um, okay. Which is why uh, the, other, um, the other place to go would be the Johnson Schmidt Associates down in Corning. They're very good. And they do a lot. They've done a lot of the storage districts. Um, Throws to Ben in Shimon County, Yates County. David uh, Anderson. Yeah, the, the, the chat for me, the, the, the question is how restrictive are you? Is it just uh, five or is it, is it broader? We're not restrictive at all. So we would go by what the consultant recommends and what SHPO agrees with. Okay. And I'm being very frank here, Virginia tends to be more conservative. So that's why you might want to talk to the consultant first and see what they think. And then there's this other piece of historic context. So it's all about the story that you tell and the history that you're telling and how complete that is. Because if the town really has its own history of development that extends beyond this core, then you could make a case for being more expansive. Generally, we don't see town-wide districts. That's pretty rare. It's usually the village or the hamlet. Um, you know, like in Lyons, which is now, there's no more village of Lyons, it's a town, but it's that village core, which I guess is now um, So, because you, you're, the district has to have a, co a cohesive story and significance and evolution of development and that will help define your boundaries. But if you want to keep telling, so when I was driving from Leroy, there's a section where there's newer houses. And if those are, say those were built in the 50s and 60s, you could tell that story because they're over 50 years old. But you would have to weave that into the rest of this history and the rest of the story and make that a kind of, make some continuity there. Um, the, the story of Group 5, I think, is probably the, in some ways the more important compelling one for us to tell. And if we're looking at being able to bring in those kind of multiple historical layers of architecture, that, that development and how this corridor, um, I, I think, might be, you know, just at first thought, kind of the most effective way of telling who we are as a community. Yeah. And that would mean that. Morganville would have its own separate district. It would have its own story. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because that's exactly. exactly. That, while that's only a mile of the road, that's, that's yes. still but its it, own it is a very different place. story. Yeah. Yes. yes. So that would be how I would think about it. Where does this story end and then somebody else's story begin? Yeah. Anything <laughs> else? Well, thank you for. I really have it. I hope they've got it all down. Oh, we have it all down. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can start by calling, calling a couple of consultants. And, and I've thrown out a bunch of names. Um, and I, so you have some choices. And you can call all of them. You don't, it doesn't cost 
cost, it shouldn't cost money to have somebody give you an estimate or talk to you about um, this project. So call a couple people or a few people, talk to them, see what their availability is, see what their interest is. Um, ideally, they would come and take a look. Um, a lot of people use, I do it too, use Google Street View because it's a way you can, but you can't go up to 37 in Google Street View, I don't think. Um, you can? You can. Yeah, because I because when we talked, I was on it, and I was like, oh, I can't go any further. So they really need to come here, which is which is good probably. Um, and uh, and then you can get a feel for a who uh, who can give a proposal, who you all like working with, um, and who is the most economical. Uh, and I will email um, uh, our consultant list. Um, you know, I'll see if Frank or you know it to me today. Uh, so that would be your first step. And then you also want to talk to Virginia. But I would recommend having a sense of what you and the consultant think that the boundaries are going to be so that you're starting the conversation with Virginia with the consultant on the phone from, like, from a more informed kind of direction. Um, and I think that would help uh, provide the most options. So we're, we're looking at probably a, a three-year timeline, four-year timeline. Oh, I uh, it's 18 months. Wow. If you want to apply this spring, okay. you apply spring of 2020. You'll know by summer. So um, run applications due in March. Uh, so you know, spend this time. You guys are you are nice and early, so you've got time. Um, spend you know the next six months, seven months. Talking to the consultant, getting proposals, you can start fundraising even. Applications for preserving work will be out in January, late December, early January. Due in March, you'll know by um, 4th of July, and then you can start your project, and it should be complete within 12 months. So, so maybe two years. Well, that, that comes with the 200th anniversary is 2020, isn't it? Yeah, so it could be integrated. Okay. Can it be integrated? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. What could a, a ballpark cost of the cost of all these little, little things or big things that we have to fund? Um, I'm thinking, you know, we have to approach the historical society. Are you telling me I can't approach the town? We don't want any town funds. Oh, I think we'd be good to approach the town. The town should want to fund this because it's helping with economic development. And even five hundred dollars from a town makes a difference. You know, it shows their investment. Um, I don't know how many buildings we're talking about, but if we're talking a hundred, two hundred buildings at most, let's say a hundred. At most. At most. I would think this is I got off my building. This should this should not be. I, I would guess this is somewhere between $7,500 and $12,000. Um, and we can fund up to 80% of that. So that is, you know, $1,500 to $3,000 that needs to be raised in the community. And honestly, it should be, right? Because yeah. the community should want it. And all these homeowners are going to get tax credits for, you know, new roofs. Uh, so, you know, big sale, I mean, literally, it's the $500 big sale, it's $500 from the town, it's, you know, there's ways to patch together support, um, and then you can start, would you recommend that, you know, like the historical society just doesn't fund it, outright fund it? The whole $12,000, or the match? The whole, like, the whole no, story? The, the, the part that we end up having to pay. They could. They, I don't know your budget. I don't know the historical society's budget. So, I mean, if the historical society has $1,500 or $3,000 to put towards it, then... But the little fundraisers would be excellent. But what about the people that live and they know, I'm, I'm outside that district, so I'm not interested in no. helping you. Right. That's okay. I mean, they don't have to. Right. right. So it's really, that's that's fine. It's rare that we get individual, well, that we, we don't know. It's rare that project sponsors, applicants, 
to get individual donations from property owners. That's, that's more unusual. Typically, it's the historical society and the town or the village or the business council like in Murray, um, the county, you know, that's how most people end up with their match. It can be donations to the historical society for this purpose, sometimes that happens, um, but it's not that typical.